Yes. Hallo, hallo, välkommen. Eh, välkommen till Java Bin online. Och tusen tack till alla som tar sig tid till att delta i kväll. Eh, mitt namn, välkommen. Oj, mitt namn är er Karl Löland. Jag representerar Java Bin Sörlande som är er en av regionerna i Java Bin. Vi har delt på ansvaret för att arrangera dessa Java Bin online möten runt på de olika regionerna och i kväll så är er det vår tur i Avobin Sörlande. Lite rask information om Avobin. vi är er den norska Java brukföreningen. Och vi har åtta regioner runt i Norge och arrangerar månatliga meetups i tillägg till att arrangera Java så. Eh, gång var Java så online så då arrangerade vi det slik. Uh, vi anser disse Javabin online mötena som en uh, coronavänlig lösning men vi väntar på att epidemin ska svinna hen. Och vi uh, kan börja med normala möten. Det är er planlagt flera slike Javabin online möten framöver. Ehm uh, uh, i kväll så er vi så heldig att ha med Grace Jansen och Kate Stanley som ska hålla föredrag om reacting to event driven world. Her vil det bli forklart hvordan Kafka som med reaktiv applikasjonsarkitektur kan brukes for å håndtere våre moderne behov. Eh, Grace Jansen er en developer advocate hos IBM og tidligere biolog og Techwoman 100 vinner. Kate Stanley er en software engineer hos IBM og jobber i Eventstreams teamet hos IBM UK. Hun har også vært medforfatter på IBM Redbooken om Java Microservices. Så då tänkte jag och gå vidare och se si hallo till vår föredragshållare. Eh, uh, hello to you too. Uh, Kate and Grace, how are you doing this afternoon? Hello. Good, thank you. Very good. Yeah, very good. Thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for being able to make it here this afternoon and hold this this talk for us. We are looking forward to it. So, thank you for I just us. Sorry? Thank you for having us. Ah, nice. Thank you. So I just gave you a, a small introduction of you two in uh, Norwegian, and I was uh, wondering if you could uh, introduce yourself in, uh, yeah, in your own language, English. Yeah, Norwegian may be a little bit difficult, <laughs> uh, unfortunately. Although my parents live in Trondheim, I only speak about four different words, um, like tack, file, and a couple of others. So not very helpful for intros. Um, but thank you so much for having us. It's really great to join sort of the Norwegian developer community again, um, and to be able to present with the wonderful Kate Stanley today. Uh, so, yeah, my name is Grace Jansen. I'm a developer advocate at IBM in the UK, and I focus primarily on sort of the Java and the JVM ecosystem, looking at things like reactive technologies um, and deploying these sort of Java based applications onto cloud native infrastructure. And my Twitter handles on the screen if you want to follow me. And today I'm presenting with the wonderful Kate Stanley. Yes. Uh, hello, I'm Kate Stanley. I'm also a developer at IBM, so I'm a software engineer, so I work on a product day to day, uh, most recently IBM Event Streams, which is a Kafka related product. So over the last couple of years, I've done a lot of work around Kafka, both in the product way, but also I've been doing a lot of talks about Kafka at conferences, getting started with Kafka and then diving into some deeper topics as well. Um, and I love sort of reaching out to people and introducing them to Kafka and also helping people understand how to get the best out of Kafka. Thank you very much. So uh, my plan, is, the plan for this uh, talk is that uh, after you have presented, we have collected some questions for you and we have a small Q&A session, if that is okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, after thinking that, uh, let's uh, just move on, and I will we will start with the presentation. So uh, I will uh, leave the audio, and leave you guys are alone. Sounds good. Cool. So um, as was already said, we're going to be talking today about reacting to an event-driven world. So before we get into events and event-driven, let's first uh, talk about some coffee. So um, we know that lots of people love coffee. Um, myself and Grace actually aren't so keen on coffee, but we know that it makes a great demo. So 
there are many examples that start with a coffee example and this is the one we're going to start with today to try and give you a bit of a flavour for why you might want to look at reactive when you're looking at event driven. So let's start with a basic barista example. So we have our coffee lovers and they've come into the coffee shop and they want to place orders and when you're first writing a simple application it kind of makes sense to use more synchronous based um, communication, it's much easier to write it when you're sort of starting off. So we might have our coffee lovers that are doing rest requests into our application and then passing that along to the uh, barista who's gonna make the coffee. Now this works okay to begin with, but you'll soon find that if you have a lot of coffee lovers, this simple application doesn't really hold up very well. And an obvious thing to do is to start looking at how can I prevent the barista getting overwhelmed and how can I help my coffee lovers to place their order and then them to go sit down, chat about Java or whatever they want to talk about before they get their coffee. And a way to do this is by introducing event-driven architecture. So event-driven architecture is where you have this event messaging backbone at the core of your application. So you've got requests that are coming in, you can have applications that are producing events into your event messaging backbone, and then you can have different applications that are consuming and passing them back in. So if you add this into the coffee shop demo, what this means is that we have a situation where the coffee lovers are still Send, uh, sending their requests into the coffee shop using REST. But when they want to actually then have the coffee be made, the coffee shop will put all of their orders onto this event backbone. So once the orders are in the coffee shop, the coffee lovers can actually go sit down, they can chill out and not worry about what they're doing. Then the barista is free to read all of the events off the event backbone and make the coffees. What this means is you can actually immediately start to see that it allows our coffee lovers to not have to wait for their coffees and they can instead watch the board for all of their coffees to turn up. And actually this application is available in GitHub. If you go and run this in GitHub and run the synchronous with REST-based versus the event-based, you'll see that the event-based one does work better. So this can lead to an interesting question, which is, is my coffee shop non-reactive and uh, sorry, reactive and event driven. And it's really easy, or rather, sorry, is your microservice fully um, non blocking and highly responsive? And it's really easy to answer that with yes, of course it is. I'm using Kafka. But that's not quite the whole story, is it, Grace? No, unfortunately, it's not. So Utilising Kafka is a really fantastic tool when you're introducing some of these more asynchronous, non-blocking behaviours at the data level. But our applications aren't just sort of made up of one layer. There's several different layers we need to be thinking about when we're trying to introduce this non-blocking, highly responsive behaviour end-to-end throughout our entire applications. So this is when we need to start thinking about how we can best utilize tools like Kafka and other tools to really build reactive end-to-end -end systems. And this is where this concept of reactive systems comes into play. So reactive systems is really this sort of overarching view of your entire application and how we can introduce more non-blocking, more reactive and responsive behaviors. So it's based on something called the reactive manifesto. And this was originally introduced in 2013 and then they updated it in 2014. So in this manifesto, it lists out the key behaviours or the key characteristics we want to be seeing when we're really building applications that are able to be as reactive as possible um, and be able to react to this event driven world that we've created. And so it's based on four key characteristics. The underlying characteristic that really drives the other behaviours is having this message driven asynchronous backbone of communication within our application. And this is really about decoupling the components or the microservices within our application um, to allow the other behaviours. So really making it asynchronous and decoupled. But why does it matter that it's a message driven and not event driven? 
Interestingly, in the original reactor manifest, it was actually event driven that they had as this underlying characteristic, but they switched to message driven in the second man version of the manifesto. And you can read about why they made that switch uh, by visiting online. If you just Google for it, uh, there's a blog article that then explains that switch that they made. But actually, let's take a look at what the difference really is. So we've got a definition here on the left of messages and a definition of events. So messages uh, we defined as an item of data sent to a specific location, whereas events are more of a signal emitted by a component upon reaching a given state. So it's really this difference in terms of this specific location versus just emitting the signal. But actually, when you take a look at it, you can kind of have a weird mesh of both. So you can have a message that contains an encoded event in its payload. But actually, when we're looking at Kafka, it doesn't really matter because Kafka doesn't reference either events or messages. It might have traditionally been viewed as sort of this event driven tool, but actually they reference records, not events or messages. Um, as you can see here on their website, they reference publishing and subscribing to streams of records, storing records in a durable way, or processing streams of records as they occur. And actually Kafka can be a fantastic tool for either event driven or message driven, all this uh, sort of funny mix of both that you can have. So Kafka can be a great tool that we can utilize for that underlying message driven asynchronous backbone that we need in reactive systems. But as we said, it doesn't stop at utilizing Kafka, although it's a great tool. There are other behaviors that we need, and we'll see why by looking at some of the issues we might come across with our barista example if we don't implement those other characteristics and if we just use um, sort of a pack by itself without thinking things through. So here we have our barista example again. But in this case, we only have three coffee lovers making orders. And as we all know, there are more than three coffee lovers in the world, although excluding Kate and I. So let's see what happens when we introduce some additional coffee lovers into our application. What we're doing here is we're increasing the load on our application with this influx of coffee orders that's coming in. Now, it's fantastic that we've got this sort of event backbone in place because that does act as a sort of buffer. So it means that we've now got this this queue or this the, these coffee orders sort of lined up in our event backbone, ready for the barista to choose and sort of sort of create and process. But and so what this means is that the coffee lovers aren't stuck at the till. However, we still have a point of potential failure, a point of potential contention um, because we've got this sort of limit of resources with in regards to our barista microservice. So we've only got one barista microservice here having to process all of that influx of coffee orders and our barista can only work so fast. So in this regard, we could have our barista who suddenly can't deal with this influx of requests. We could have potential processing issues, um, but we're also giving a very slow service to our coffee lovers because we're only able to make so many coffees in such little time. So what we really need to introduce uh, is the behavior of elasticity into our application. And this is interesting. This is not just about scaling up, but also about being able to scale back down again. So scaling up our resources to deal with that influx of load, but also once that load decreased on our application, to be able to scale that back down again so that we can then be as cost effective as possible. Let's take a look what this means in our application. Well, if we were to introduce elastic behavior into our application, we'd be able to scale up our resources. So scale up the number of barista microservices we have by perhaps creating replica or um, sort of spinning up replica microservices. So then our baristas would be able to deal with this influx of coffee orders better because now we've got four baristas making all these coffee orders rather than just one who's stressed out and overloaded. So now we're able to provide a much more responsive service to our coffee lovers and have an application that's not at potential sort of failure point because it's under so much stress and load. So we're being sort of we're gracefully dealing with this load fluctuation. So let's take a look at another potential sort of failure that might occur within our application if we don't utilize all of these behaviors and characteristics. So in this case, we've added an additional downstream component in our application. This downstream component is, in our case, a serving table. So the barista has to place the coffees on the serving table before the coffee lovers can come up and collect them. But in this case, it's representing sort of either a downstream microservice that might be needed for additional processing or perhaps an additional third party component or, or external service like a database, for example. So what happens when, let's say, the coffee lovers are being a little bit lazy, they're not coming up to collect their coffee orders. And so this serving table is getting fuller and fuller to the point where now it's completely full and the barista is juggling coffee because they can't put it down on the serving table. 
at this case, in this instance, we're essentially saying this downstream component has either gotten stuck in a process, it might have gone down or failed, and so our barista isn't able to pass on those requests for the additional processing. And so at this point, our barista is also stuck and can't make any more coffee orders. We've got a potential scenario here where we can't provide a responsive service for our coffee lovers. None of them are going to get their coffee. So at this point, we've got a potential failure case. But if we were to introduce the behavior of resiliency into our application, we could potentially gracefully deal with this potential failure. So in the case of the barista example here, perhaps it's a case of adding in, say, a circuit breaker um, and adding in, say, an additional barista and serving table instance so that all the requests could be rerouted to the additional barista and coffee serving table. Or perhaps it's a case of introducing something like, um, say, back pressure. So feedback mechanism to, to sort of for the requests coming down to sort of rate limit them. So we're not overloaded in this regard um, and we're able to feed back to the upstream components to rate limit those requests coming through. These are all sort of resilient behaviours that we can build into our application to really make sure that we're able, regardless of the failure that's occurring, that we're able to gracefully deal with it. And these behaviours lead to the last characteristic, which is to be responsive. And this is really the crux of being reactive. It's all about being able to respond effectively and efficiently to state changes and to events within our system. And by implementing these four characteristics of the reactive manifesto, we can ensure that we're building a really non-blocking, asynchronous, reactive application or system. So everything I've talked about has been fairly high level so far, fairly based on sort of behaviors, very abstract. So how do we actually go about building these characteristics into our applications? So we've got a very basic microservice instance here, just three microservices to sort of point out the various different levels that we need to be considering to make sure that they're asynchronous when we're designing and building our applications. So we've already talked about sort of the data layer and we've described how Kafka can really enable great decoupling and fantastic asynchronous behaviors when it comes to that sort of data integration. But what about our application itself? So we do need to consider sort of between the microservices, and that might include things like Kafka, but it might also be direct communication. So we need to consider how the various components of our application are communicating together. And to make that reactive and, and non-blocking and asynchronous, we can use several different reactive architecture design patterns. We've listed just four here, but they're not a complete list. If you go and Google it, there are many, many more that you can take a look at and integrate into your application, depending on what's best for you. But the examples we have here include CQRS. So CQRS stands for Command Query Responsibility Segregation, and it's all about splitting out the read and the write APIs to enable really high availability of the data within your application. We've also got Circuit Breaker, which I mentioned as a potential solution to that barista example. Circuit breaking is very similar in software as it is in, say, electrical engineering, if you're familiar with it. So it's all about sort of putting a temporary block on this request to a downstream component that might be under load or under stress or potentially has failed to stop it becoming a point of contention or failure. So we allow that downstream component time to recover, time to get better. And in the meantime, we reroute any requests that would have gone to it to a different downstream component. And that might be a replica microservice. And then once that downstream component has gotten better, is healthy again, we can reinstantiate that request route. Then we've got sagas. So sagas are sort of a mechanism to take more traditional transactions that we, we might have done in a more monolithic architecture and do it in a more distributed manner. So we sort of create these multiple micro transactions that have this fallback behavior to basically account for things going wrong part way through. And then the last thing we have here is back pressure. And I mentioned this earlier. Back pressure is also um, a key feature that's utilized in many of the frameworks uh, that we'll be mentioning later on in this presentation. So it's utilized by many of them because uh, it's such a great, fantastic reactive architecture behavior to incorporate. And it's this feedback mechanism from a downstream component to an upstream component to help rate limit that downstream component so that it, if it's, say, under load, for example, it can rate limit so it doesn't get overloaded with requests and become a potential contention point or failure point. And so it's this ability for the downstream components to communicate back upstream. So we've looked at between microservices, but what about within the microservices themselves? we also need to enable that the logic within our application, within our microservices that we're sort of developing and building is reactive and asynchronous and non-blocking. And we can enable that by introducing reactive programming. So what do I mean by reactive programming? There's a very basic definition here. It's all about this asynchronicity. 
So it's a paradigm where the logic of the microservice or the logic of the application is moved forward by the availability of new information instead of by a thread of execution. So very asynchronous in its processes. And we can enable this with several different patterns. So as a Java developer, you're probably already familiar with this term of futures. If you're not, it's essentially a promise to hold the result of some operation until that operation completes. So again, focusing on that asynchronicity. We can also utilize reactive programming libraries. So these libraries are all uh, are essentially built for composing asynchronous and event-based programs. Um, and examples include RxJava and Small Ray Mutiny. Um, and we're actually going to utilize RxJava in a demo I'm going to show at the end of this presentation. And then we have reactive streams. So the reactive stream specification is really a community-driven specification designed to provide a standard for handling asynchronous data streams in a non-blocking manner, which is obviously important, while providing that all-important back pressure that I was mentioning earlier. So reactive stream specification is a fantastic tool that you can utilize and again is used by many of the frameworks we'll be looking at later on. So we've looked at sort of the data layer, we've looked at the microservice layer and we've looked at in between the microservices. So how can we then utilize all of this and utilize Kafka in the best way possible for reactive systems? So Grace has already introduced reactive systems and we've talked about this idea that actually if you move to event driven then that gives you some advantages in terms of being responsive but you need to be reactive on top of that many people are using kafka as their primary form of event driven so how are we going to use that in a reactive way so looking at those cornerstones of the reactive manifesto we start with message driven and grace has already touched on this in kafka kafka is built to be able to stream a lot of data through it, but specifically any kind of data. So she's already talked about the fact that they don't talk about messages versus events, they just talk about records. So it's up to you to define what you're going to put in your records that go through Kafka, but this means it's sort of enabled from a message driven perspective. So moving on to the next one, we're going to talk about resiliency. So how is Kafka resilient and what can you do to make use of Kafka in the best way? So first, let's talk about message retention and data persistence. One of the things that sets Kafka apart from other messaging systems that you might have come across before is the fact that it provides stream history and deals with immutable data. Unlike other systems that use queues, where once a message has been read from the queue, it's actually removed from the queue, in Kafka, you can continually read the same record over and over if you want to. This is great in terms of resiliency because it gives you additional options. If your application was to fail to process one of those records, it can come back and read it again. The immutable data refers to the fact that because we have this stream history, we aren't expecting the data to change as it flows through the system. Once it's on Kafka, it should stay like that and should stay in that particular order and things like that. So it's worth being aware that because Kafka has this stream history, there are some things you're going to have to consider in your applications that you maybe didn't have to think of before, but it means that we're allowed to keep rereading the same messages. So Kafka is designed for high resiliency. That's one of the things it's well known for. So how does that work? Well, when you deploy a Kafka cluster, you would have probably at least three brokers, but more um, if you want them. We'll see why you need three in a minute. But on those brokers, this is where we store our Kafka data. So records in Kafka are broken down into topics. So a topic is a logical grouping of similar kinds of records. It's up to you to define how they get broken down. So you might have one topic that has all orders for a specific area or addresses, or it's really up to you in your specific use case. But that's what a topic is, is a grouping of similar records. In Kafka, one of the ways we get resiliency is by having the data in a specific topic put on a leader broker and then followers. So for a specific topic and partition, and I'll come on to what partitions are a little bit later on, but they're a subset of the topic. For a specific topic and partition within that topic, one of the brokers is declared as leader. This is the broker that all of the applications will talk to when they're producing and consuming the records and all of the other brokers can then be marked as followers. What Kafka will do is it will make sure that all of the records that are arriving to the leader are automatically being replicated to the following brokers. 
This is a configuration option, so you decide how many followers you want. If your replication factor is three, you'll get a leader and two followers. But assuming you've got it turned on and configured to three, Kafka will make sure that this replication is happening. This is really good for resiliency because if your leader broker were to go down, you've still got all of your data. Kafka will make sure that everything is good. And when you're deploying your Kafka cluster, you should make sure that your brokers are distributed. After all, Kafka is a distributed event streaming platform. So assuming everything is distributed, then you can expect only one broker to go down at once, hopefully, which means that we've then got two remaining brokers with the data and the brokers will just have a leader election, elect a new leader, and all of the Kafka clients are already set up to understand this behavior and to know when to swap to talking to the new leader. So this is one way that Kafka provides us with resiliency. But although Kafka will hold on to your records, if something goes wrong within Kafka, you also need to make sure that your applications can be resilient from the point of view of records they produce actually getting to Kafka, and then when they consume them, to actually consume them at the other end. So let's look at our producers and consumers. So a producer is an application that produces records, and there are a few things you need to consider. First, you need to think about what delivery guarantees do you need for your producer? If you want very high resiliency and high guarantees, you're looking for at least once producing. So that means you don't mind if there are duplicates, but you really want that message to arrive. If you're dealing with data where actually a few entries could be missed, so maybe it's sensor data that goes every second, and if every now and again there's one that doesn't quite get through, then you might look at most once delivery, where you aren't going to get duplicates, but sometimes you might miss entries. Both of these are configured by looking at the acts and the retries in your producing application. So acts is short for acknowledgments, and this basically means, does your producer need an acknowledgement from Kafka when it produces a record? There are a few different options. So you can go with a sort of fire and forget mode where Kafka doesn't tell you whether it's fully um, sort of got the record, and or you can go for all where you're saying, I want all of the replication to happen before you tell me that you've got the record. Depending on how you configure this, you can get different levels of re resiliency in terms of the message actually arriving into Kafka, but you need to think about it for your use case and what level you need. On top of that, you do need to consider retries. Obviously, if X doesn't succeed and you haven't written correctly, you probably want to retry. A lot of clients do have this built in already, so it might be that you could just go with the defaults, but it's worth considering. So now we've talked about producers, let's consider consumers. So consuming in Kafka and resilient consuming is all related to the stream history and how that's managed. So because we have this stream history, we need to have a mechanism that means we can know which record we're actually reading. So we do this using an offset. So an offset in Kafka is basically a number that's assigned to a specific record within that partition and topic so that you know which record you're trying to read. This means when you're producing to Kafka, you always add onto the end. So you can see here the number five, that means we're adding onto the end of that um, topic. So when you're a consumer, you need to know which offset you're reading from. And Kafka provides you a mechanism so that if the application goes down and comes back up again, it can actually store its offset in Kafka so that when it comes back up, it knows where to carry on reading. You have to make sure you're doing this because of the stream history. So if your application goes down and comes back up, it really could start from the beginning and read all of the records again. But there are actually two different ways to do this. One is using auto commit and one is using manual commit. So let's look at the difference. Starting with auto commit. Auto commit means that you haven't written any code in your application to commit the offsets but you also haven't disabled the setting that does auto commit. So this is the kind of default setup. What this would mean is if we have this topic, so this is our coffee topic, we've got different records on it. So those are the different orders, the coffee, cappuccino and latte. Say if our barista is our consumer, they would consume the first record, coffee, and then as they're processing it, the 
auto commit would kick in. So the client under the covers would tell Kafka, yes, I've read this coffee order and Kafka would sort of tick it off. In reality, this is a topic where the offset is stored. So this is all fine. However, if the barista doesn't finish processing the coffee, so say he accidentally drops it, then the next time he comes back up again, so in a consuming way, this is our application going down and coming back up, the barista would look in Kafka to see, okay, what was the last offset that I read? And I'll just go to the next one. So it would then read the cappuccino, process the cappuccino, then the latte. And although we haven't lost any records because they are all in your topic in Kafka, to the consumer, it looks like you have because it's missed out the coffee. So it's worth thinking about what does processing a record mean to me? And would manual commit work better? So let's look at manual commit in this example. So if we do manual commit, initially it's the same, the barista reads the coffee, but the difference is here for manual commit, you have put a line in your code that says when you're going to commit. And the important thing is to do the commit once you've finished processing the record. So for the barista's point of view, processing the record fully means I've served up the coffee. So if we only commit once we've served up the coffee, then that means even if the barista were to drop something or go down, when it comes back up, it can continue from where it left off. And we haven't accidentally committed too early. So in this example, the barista would read the cappuccino and the latte next, and we would get all of our coffee orders. So it's worth thinking about, am I going to need my manual commit? Do I need to think carefully about how long it's going to take me to process records and what happens if my application goes down or can I stick with the default auto commit and it will just commit on a timer and that's okay for me. Just need to think about resiliency and which one is better for you. So I've talked about Kafka and I've talked about producers consumers. I also want to talk about decoupling and breaking changes. So for Kafka, it's worth considering looking at schemas and schema registries. In the same way that if you were using a REST-based application, you would get told use versions, you really should be using schemas and a schema registry for your applications. Because otherwise, if your producer changes the shape of your copy order and the consumer doesn't know about it, you are going to have breaking changes. And even though you've added this event backbone and sort of decoupled your applications, they are going to cause each other to go down. So it's worth looking into this. There isn't a schema registry that's part of core Kafka, but there are plenty of open source and um, sort of like proprietary schema registries that you can try if you want to look at a schema registry for Kafka. So let's look now at elasticity. So within Kafka, when we talk about elasticity, we can talk about, again, the brokers and then the producers, consumers. So for scalability in Kafka, we use partitions. So this is where Kafka is really designed to allow you to have a lot of applications all connected at once. And it does this partially using partitions. So for every topic, you can define how many partitions you want, and Kafka will spread the partitions across the different brokers. Again, because Kafka is designed to be distributed, this means that because it's spread out, you won't have all of your load on one specific broker. So this works great for producing as well, because the producers um, will round robin, or you can have them producing to certain partitions, but in general, they'll round robin. You'll find that you can have lots and lots of producers and they won't overload your Kafka. The interesting one for elasticity in Kafka really comes in the consumers, and Kafka have a really neat feature for this, which is consumer groups. So again, this comes back to the stream history. Because Kafka has stream history, if you stand up two consumers in normal circumstances, they might read the same records. But potentially, you want to have a lot of different applications. You want to be able to scale up your baristas, for example, but you don't want them all making the same coffee order. So that's where a consumer group comes in. So let's look at how they work. Say I've got three partitions in this specific topic, and I've got two different consumer groups. Now, consumer joins a group if they join with a specific group ID. So it's just a configuration option in your application. So in this case, I've got three consumers in group A, 
and two consumers in group B. What this will mean is Kafka will make sure that between all of the consumers in your group, they will get all of the records. So in practice, for group A, this means they'll get one partition each. Ordering in Kafka is done per partition. So this means that each of the consumers will be reading those records in the correct order, and they won't get the same records as each other. For consumer group B, I've only got two consumers. So in that case, one of them will end up with two of the partitions. But again, ordering is per partition, so we haven't got any ordering problems here, and it's okay for a consumer group to read from more than one partition. The final thing to consider, though, is what happens if you add an additional consumer to consumer group A. So if you add an additional consumer to consumer group A, it won't receive any records. And this is to do with the stream history and the ordering. So consumer group A, because we've got this stream history, it can't read from any of the other partitions because you wouldn't know which records it was supposed to be reading. In addition, it would then muck up your ordering because it's ordered per partition. So for Kafka, if you want to have good elasticity, so being able to scale up and scale down, for your producers, that works great. Scale them up, scale them down, there's no problem. For consumers, again, you can scale them up and down, but the things to consider is you need to make use of consumer groups, but you also need to consider how many partitions you've got because you can only scale up to the number of partitions. If you add additional partitions into Kafka, then that's fine, you can do that, but it does change that ordering guarantee. And it's worth noting that actually, the more partitions you have, the more work that is needed to be done if one of the brokers goes down and the leader elections need to happen and that sort of thing. So there is an overhead, it's not free to add partitions. So you do want to make sure that you have roughly the right number of partitions before you get started, rather than trying to add loads of partitions when you're midway through um, a sort of running system. So we talked about Kafka and the different cornerstones of the Reactive Manifesto. Now let's look at how you can actually write an application that is reactive as well. So we'll start with looking at sort of the standard Java Kafka clients, which are the standard Java Kafka producer and consumer. Now, although these are sort of great starting points and they have some really useful features like pause and resume, they haven't been designed with reactive systems in mind. So what we'd suggest is perhaps starting off with these, having a play around, trying out Kafka if you've not used it before, and then taking a look at some of the more uh, sort of the reactive frameworks and toolkits that are available that connect in with Kafka through these sort of clients uh, to be able to gain some of the benefits that you wouldn't necessarily get otherwise. So things like simplified APIs, um, sort of sort of splitting up of sort of the pro produce the, the processing of the records and the polling of the records. So they add additional features that you don't get with the standard Java Kafka clients. So again, not an exhaustive list. These are just some of the reactive frameworks and toolkits. There are others like, for example, Project Reactor that we just haven't included in this presentation, uh, but we've included some others to take a look at. So we've got here Alpaca, MicroProfile and Vertex, and they're the frameworks and toolkits we're going to be taking a look at in more detail. So the Alpaca framework. So Alpaca is a library that connects in with Kafka and it essentially allows consuming and producer from Kafka with something called Akka streams. Now, that's essentially the uh, reactive stream specification I mentioned earlier. It's Akka's version. Akka is a, an open source framework or toolkit that you can utilize uh, for reactive applications. And it was originally produced by a company called Lightbend, but it is all open source and it connects in with some other frameworks as well. Now, the interesting thing about this particular library and the reason we've included it because it's so different to the others is that it uses something called an actor model. So if you've not come across this before, it's a, it's a different conceptual model to using, say, microservices, and there isn't necessarily a one to one mapping between the two. So with actors, the actor is the primitive unit of computation. So it's the thing that receives a message and does some kind of computation on it. And those messages are sent between actors uh, via something. They have these mailboxes to essentially store them until they're ready to process. So actors are a very different style of sort of creating applications. So if you're not already using the actor model, um, it might be a bit of a paradigm or shift if you wanted to make use of this framework. But if you are already using the actor based model in your own application, this might be a really interesting framework to take a look at 
for a reactive Kafka connection. So then we move on to MicroProfile. So if you've not come across MicroProfile, it is a, a really community driven specification um, all around sort of enterprise Java microservices. So building microservice based applications on things like Java EE or Jakarta EE. And again, these are all open source. So it's developed by a wide range uh, of sort of individuals, organizations and vendors within the community. And this is what it offers. So these are the APIs that the MicroProfile community develops that are really designed to enable microservice sort of cloud based distributed types of applications. So the bottom triangle here in gray is actually the standard APIs you get as part of that standard stack. And in fact, uh, this is the 3.3 stack because this is the one we'll be utilizing in the demo. But there is a newer stack uh, 4.0 if you want to go and check that out. But MicroProfile also works on sort of standalone projects as well. So in the right hand corner here, you'll see the sort of sideways L shape. And these are the standalone projects the MicroProfile community works on that aren't yet part of the standard stack. And the one we're interested in is the reactive messaging specification. So this specification, this API makes use of two other specifications. So it makes use of the reactive streams operator specification, another standalone project within the MicroProfile community. And this offers a really basic set of operators to sort of link the different reactive components together and to perform processing on the data that passes between them. But it also utilizes the reactive stream specification that I mentioned earlier in the reactive programming part of this presentation. So it utilizes those two specifications and it offers this ability to sort of create um, reactive communication within your application. So it utilizes something called annotations. So it essentially adds annotations onto an application's beans methods. And those are either at incoming or at outgoing annotations. These annotations are then linked up via channels, uh, depending on whether it's internal or external. So if it's internal, so just between two different methods within your application, it's just called a channel. If it's connecting to, say, an external messaging system, it's called a connector. So we'll see that later on in the demo. But these channels are essentially just opaque streams that we've named in order to link up those annotations. So you can see here we've linked method A with method B via that channel called order. So this is how MicroProfile Reactive Messaging introduces these reactive principles. Let's take a look at our third and final framework. So Eclipse Vertex. So whilst the others, well, at least MicroProfile for sure, focuses more on Java, um, this is a more polyglot framework. So this can be used with Java, JavaScript, Scala, Kotlin, et cetera, and many other languages. It's based on something called the reactor pattern. So it's sort of, uh, it's a very, very much an event driven architecture style. And it uses sort of a single threaded event loop, which is actually blocking on resource emitting events. And then it dispatches them to corresponding handlers and callbacks. So it runs on the JVM. Um, it's very non-blocking, it's event driven and it includes this distributed event bus and it is single threaded. And actually we chose to utilize Vertex when we were re-architecturing one of our own applications. Yes, so we built a Vertex demo app for Kafka applications. The reason we actually built this in the first place was just because we found that a lot of people um, get started really easily with Kafka running the shell scripts that come with it. But if you want to actually then move across to writing a Java app, often you don't know where to start. So it's an application that produces a record to Kafka and then consumes it back again. So maybe not the most realistic example, but it helps people to make sure they've configured their Kafka correctly and to start to understand some of the concepts around the different consumer groups, offsets, and that sort of thing. We also added a UI onto it because we wanted people to be able to see these things. So like, what are my offsets? How big are my records? And that sort of thing. All of the code for this application is open source. So if you want to have a look at it and contribute, then feel free to check it out on GitHub. So we're just going to show a little video here of the actual UI running so you can kind of see the example. But the reason we found it interesting to re-architecture this is originally we wrote it with the basic Kafka producer consumer clients. They're using Java uh, and that worked OK. But what we really wanted was to be able to do a produce, but then a consume and pause the both the producing and the consuming. We wanted people to be able to produce a few records, pause everything, change their mind, change it to something else. And we thought this would be fairly straightforward. But actually, using the basic 
uh, Kafka producer consumer clients, we found that producing worked okay. So for produce, you can start producing and then you can stop producing. You can send that along the WebSocket and that all kind of works fine. The change in uh, moving to Vertex wasn't a massive change and that was okay. But it was actually consuming and processing the records where we found the most um, advances in terms of moving to a more reactive system. And this was around the poll loop that we have in Kafka. So when you're polling with a normal consuming application, you do a poll and then you get back a set of records and you have to iterate through all of those records to process them. Now, if you're just doing, you know, polling and you're not having to start and stop partway through your application, then this works fine. But because this part is single threaded, if you're wanting to pause consuming and then resume consuming, you have to handle the thread somehow. So what we did instead was we looked at reactive. So right at the beginning, Grace said a reactive application is based on the arrival of new information. And because we have this WebSocket from the UI that's sending starts and stops, it made sense to us to make the change and use a more reactive based. And if we swap to a reactive based application, we can use the handler. So this is something that Vertex enables, but it's similar to what you would have in MicroProfile and in Acker. In Vertex, you can still do the polling, um, but for our application, the handler made more sense. So instead of having to do a poll and then process all the records, you can see that we just have a handler that gets called every time a new record arrives. And then separately to that, we can have a pause and resume. And what Vertex will do it was, is it will make sure that the handler doesn't get called back with new data once we pause and resume. The pause and resume is something that is in core Kafka. So we were already using that in the first version of our application. But for moving to Vertex, it just suddenly felt like the clients were working exactly how we wanted them to and how it made sense for our application. So I think for me, at least, what it kind of showed was that if you're writing an application that's dealing with Kafka and doing event-driven, you can use the normal producer consumer clients, the ones that ship with Kafka, but you might find that moving to a reactive system and a reactive programming um, language, it immediately feels like it fits a lot better with your use case. If you're interested in sort of more details of like what we changed and what we found was useful, then do check out this blog post that we've talked about our experiences of writing a reactive Kafka application. We've also included in here some of the other Vertex features that were really good. But in that summary for this talk, uh, what we want you to take away is that using um, non -re having a non-reactive application and then just adding Kafka doesn't make you reactive. You do need to think about the reactive manifesto and the other pieces. Kafka is great, but it is very configurable and you need to think about how you're going to configure both the brokers and your applications to make the best reactive system. But the open source community, reactive community is on hand to help. So you don't have to write a reactive application from scratch. You can make use of all of these different applications that are already there. And a lot of these communities have also been uh, contributing to Kafka and making Kafka better for reactive systems as well. So there are plenty of toolkits and reactive frameworks that can provide you with additional benefits um, that you wouldn't get if you were just using uh, the non-reactive ones. To give you a bit of a summary of sort of reactive, what reactive systems are, when you'd want to use them and how to go about using them, there's this short ebook that you can access and it is free online. It's only about 30 pages long uh, and it can provide sort of a really great summary of some of the concepts we've been describing in this session today. So I'm actually going to show you a really quick demo app of just how easy it is to get started with some of these reactive frameworks when you're utilizing, say, Kafka in a Java based application. So these are our online interactive labs and they are available after this session. Um, and there are other modules available if you'd like to take a look at some of the other microprofile specifications or APIs. We're going to be focusing on obviously the microprofile reactive messaging specification, which is in module one of this particular sort of uh, workshop or set of labs. 
If you want to check out some of the others, you can do afterwards in your own time and you can also run through this one too. So I'm just going to end this show and switch to this, which is a live demo. So hopefully you can see all of this. This is our online environment. And as you can see, there's lots of modules you can take a look at um, and other modules that I could link to. If you want to message me on Twitter, I can send those across. So I've already logged into the environment. It will ask you to log in with sort of either some sort of social login. Uh, so hopefully you should all have at least GitHub. So it should be fairly easy to log in. So it brings you to this online environment, which is really fantastic because you don't need any um, sort of locally downloaded uh, dependencies or anything like that. Uh, there's nothing local on your machine. It's all in our environment here. So on the left hand side, we have instructions. On the right hand side, we have our ID to E. And then in the bottom right here, once you go to terminal, new terminal, you get new terminal. So we'll get started. And this application is essentially, here's a basic diagram view of it. It's, it's quite a basic application because this is just to show you how easy it is to get started with it. So we've got two microservices, system and inventory. So the system microservice essentially calculates the average CPU and then posts that to Kafka every 15 seconds. So it produces that event. And then the inventory microservice consumes that data and provides an updated list of all of the sort of systems and their most current CPU average. So if we go ahead and essentially clone this GitHub project, shouldn't take too long, and CD into the right one, we can start creating the different files that we'll need for this application. And I'll show you sort of where MicroProfile Reactive comes into this in each of them. So we're going to be utilizing these touch commands just because it makes it a lot easier for us to quickly create them. And then you'll see here there's a U next to the files that we created. So it makes it easy to follow along uh, in the Explorer view as well. So here's that first system service class we've created for the system microservice. So this is the one publishing to Kafka, the average CPU load. So if we copy and paste in the code we provided for you here, you can actually see because this is the one producing, we're utilizing the outgoing annotation here. And we're utilizing uh, Kafka and we're publishing to the Kafka topic system load. As I said, we also make many of the frameworks and applications that are sort of reactive and connected with Kafka, um, they utilize RxJava. So they utilize some form of programming, reactive programming library. So we are actually utilizing RxJava, as you can see, sort of in our dependencies and our imports here. Um, and we're utilizing the, uh, the flowable function. So flowable, uh, in this case, we're using flowable interval, and it essentially allows us to set the interval at which we want to collate that and, and calculate the average system load. Um, flowable actually enables back pressure. So it was introduced in the newest version of RxJava in RxJava 2.0 uh, as an alternative to observable to enable that inbuilt back pressure, which is really important in reactive systems. So moving on, we're just going to quickly create the uh, inventory resource class. So if we go ahead and use the touch command again, so in this time, instead of going into system, we're going to go into inventory and then go into SRC and follow these U's down. Again, it's fairly easy to follow. And there we'll see our new file. So if we go ahead and open that up and then copy and paste in this code. So this one's for the inventory uh, microservice. So this is the one consuming from Kafka. So in this one, we're utilizing the app incoming annotations because it's consuming. But again, we're still consuming from this same uh, system topic, system load topic in Kafka. So now if we go ahead, we need to use uh, some configuration. So this configuration, we're actually utilizing MicroProfile config. So that's one of the other MicroProfile um, APIs that's offered as part of the standard stack. So if we head on over to system, and this time, instead of going into Java, we're going to head into resources and open up that MicroProfile config properties file. Once we open it up, we can copy and paste in this configuration. Now, as you can see here, as I mentioned earlier, if it's an internal channel connecting the annotations, it's just called a channel. If it's connecting to an external messaging service, for example, it's called a connector. And because MicroProfile is just a specification, it will depend on the implementation you're using as to which connectors you can use. So we're using Open Liberty in this demonstration, which is our open source web application server from IBM. And so because of that, we're utilizing the Liberty Kafka connector because we're connecting from Open Liberty to Kafka. In this case, we're also in our configuration specifying which topic we're using within Kafka. And we have to include a serializer here so that we can serialize our object into JSON for Kafka. So let's go ahead and create the second configuration file we need, which is for the inventory microservice. 
So again, using that touch command just makes it a bit easier for us. So let's head into inventory and again, outside of Java and into resources. If we open up this second microprofile configuration properties file, we can then copy and paste in this code. Now you'll notice it looks fairly similar, but now instead of outcoming, we're using the incoming. We're still using the same connector. We're still using the same topic. This time we've got a deserializer because we're going from JSON into an object and we have an extra configuration value. This links into what Kate was explaining about with that those Kafka consumer groups. So because we're consuming from Kafka, we need to have that consumer group ID so that if we were to spin up multiple instances of the inventory microservice, we wouldn't be duplicating processing of those records and we'd have that order and guarantee because they'd be part of the same consumer group. So now that we've created that, we can quickly create our server.xml configuration file. So if we go into this time back into system, now the server configuration file is the same for um, the system microservice and the inventory microservice. So we're only going to show you one of them because there's no point sharing you both. So if we open that up and copy and paste in this, you can see some of the sort of features that we're making use of in this application. So you can see here is where we're making use of microprofile reactive messaging, but we're also making use of some of the other um, sort of standard APIs that come as standard as part of that microprofile stack like microprofile config, which allows us to externalize the configuration, really useful for sort of cloud native applications. So the next thing we need to do is create our pom.xml file. So we can use that again using this touch command. And if we open up, uh, there it is, oh, pom.xml, then we can copy and paste it in. And here you can see the dependencies we're utilizing. So this one's a bit of a long one. Copy and paste this in. So you can see here that we're actually utilizing uh, there's the Rx Java dependency that we need for Flowable. We're also utilizing Kafka, as you can see here. Here's the microprofile reactive messaging dependency, and here's the sort of standard stack dependency that we need as well. We're also making use of Jakarta. So let's go ahead. This time we need to sort of navigate into the start directory just to make sure we've got we're in the right location to get this started. And we're going to go ahead and essentially run some of our Maven uh, goals to get this application up and running. So the first one we need to, to install is the Maven uh, models install, and then we need to do a Maven package. We're going to run this Docker command um, to essentially make sure that we have the latest version of Open Liberty, uh, and that's because this is a shared online environment. So there's other people that could potentially be downloading different versions. So we just want to make sure we have the right version in here uh, when we start so that it's not going to create any issues for us. So if we quickly do that Docker pull command, and then we can do our Docker builds. So we're going to be building our system microservice first and then our inventory microservice. And then following on from that, we're going to be running this start container script. Now we've written this script so that we can just essentially start up all of the containers you'll need when we're starting this application. So that does include a container for, um, micro for the microservices involved in this application, so system and inventory, but also containers for Kafka and also Zookeeper. Um, so right now, Kafka, the version of Kafka we're utilizing does still need Zookeeper so that it can store the metadata it needs. Um, in future versions of Kafka, that will be in a Kafka topic itself, so you won't need Zookeeper anymore. So they look like they're up and running, so let's do a start containers script. And then once this is all up and running, what we can do is we can return to the home project. And if you remember from, I'm not sure if you remember from that first diagram, so if I go all the way back to step Two. So we're utilizing microprofile reactive messaging in between the system, uh, microservice, Kafka, and the inventory microservice. But to access that list that the inventory microservice is storing, we can use this REST request. So that's what we're going to try and access now that we've got our application up and running. So let's head back to this. Uh, let's head back out of this directory. And we're going to be using this curl command to be able to see the output from the inventory service. So essentially what we're doing is we're checking that the system microservice has successfully calculated the average system load. We've then been able to successfully publish that to a Kafka topic using microprofile reactive messaging. We've been able to successfully consume that from that uh, Kafka topic for the inventory microservice and update our list of systems within the inventory microservice. This might take a little bit of a while to get going. Yeah, so you might get some of these failure messages if you try too soon just because we're only calculating that average system load every 15 seconds. So we have to wait 15 seconds and then for the whole process to go through before we can actually access that data.
wait for a little bit more. And what you should see is essentially a host name and then the average system load, and that will change um, every 15 seconds. So if you do that curl command multiple times, you'll see this one uh, changing. There we go. So there's one. And if you left it for a little bit longer, you'd be able to see that system load value should be changing um, because obviously we're updating it every 15 seconds. So hopefully this has shown you that literally in 10 minutes, I've been able to set up a Kafka Java application utilizing microprofile reactive messaging in a whirlwind tour of this guide um, to show you just how easy it can be to utilize some of these reactive um, sort of Java Kafka clients in your own applications. So uh, let's go back to the presentation and I'll finish up with some resources. Here we are. So as if we haven't given you enough here, uh, as if we haven't bombarded you with information, we've got some additional resources for you if you wanted to go off on your own and explore some more of this uh, in the future. So we've got some great reactive resources there for sort of intros into useful resources to get started using reactive. We've also got some fantastic getting started with Kafka resources. So if you've not used Kafka before, I'd recommend checking out the quick start guide, which gets you started with Kafka and Zookeeper in about 10 minutes. So super quick and easy. We've also got Strimzy. So if you're interested in sort of operators for Kafka, check out the Strimzy project, which is a fantastic open source project. Um, and if you're interested in those schemas that Kate mentioned, check out the link there for sort of an overview of schemas and why they're useful and how you can use them. And then I've also linked to the reactive Kafka libraries here. Um, so you can check out each of those and to Open Liberty, which is what all of the guides, so the interactive guides that I showed you, that's what they're based on. So if you have, hopefully we'll be going through Q&A now with you guys. Uh, thank you for staying on throughout this whole this whole session. It's been fantastic presenting to you. But if we don't get around to your question or you think of one later, our Twitter handles are up there if you want to connect with us. So thank you very much. Awesome. <clears throat> thank you very much. That was a very great talk. <laughs> uh, so we have some uh, questions for you. Uh, the first one is, Will the slides be available for download? <laughs> uh, yep, uh, yeah, we can uh, either upload them or send them to you. We'll figure that out, but they will be available uh, and we'll share on Twitter when they are. Oh, nice. So uh, I don't know if you have seen some questions on the chat yourself, but uh, I will try to it reiterate them here on audio as well so we can record them. So uh, mm -hmm. one of the first questions we have is how would you compare Kafka's stream API with Apache Fink. Do you have any preference? Uh, so I haven't looked at Apache Flink in detail. Um, I think the nice thing about running with Kafka Streams is um, the Kafka Streams, the way it's designed is it's a Java library. So all of the processing is done in your actual applications. You're not having to deploy anything else. You just run your application. So I think that's um, pretty nice. Um, I haven't looked too deeply, though, at what the specific differences are between Flink and Streams. Um, but yeah, I think Streams is a really interesting library to check out. I don't know whether Flink offers other language support. The only downside about Kafka Streams is it is Java only currently, because the like main language that the clients that are produced for Kafka are is all Java based. Uh, yeah. Uh by, by the way, uh, you had a great talk, and uh, is it very hard for you to not have any audience to look back at it? That's my personal question. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, we miss seeing all your faces. Yeah, uh, it's yeah, it's, it's much it's much more enjoyable for us to be able to see faces, see reactions. You know, slow our pace or speed up our pace, um, and to be able to chat with you all afterwards. So yeah, definitely miss in person events. Yeah, even just in person, the two of us as well, because often there's a lag, so it can be difficult to make sure we're progressing the slides and things like that. At the same time, and it's often not clear whether there's a big gap between me and Grace talking as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, another question here is, uh, do you have uh, recommendations to organizations that try to build data platform based on Kafka producers and consumers? Uh, with regards to teams, devs, and ops, and etc. In what, in terms of a, a team, uh, like company, to go look at what they're doing? Um, I think my general recommendation in terms of looking at what people are currently doing with Kafka is to go check out the Kafka Summit talks. 
So um, Confluent is the person is the company that hosts the Kafka Summit. Uh, Grace and I actually presented at Kafka Summit last year, and uh, I'm going to be presenting again this year. But they've got all of the previous talks online and all, lots of different companies. There's basically a track where they have user um, experiences. Uh, some of the really interesting companies that are using Kafka are, I know that uh, Netflix use Kafka a lot. There's quite a few banks that are starting to use Kafka, which is really interesting. I went to a really interesting talk. I can't remember which bank it was. It might have been ING Bank, maybe, um, at Kafka Summit a couple of years ago. But I definitely, if you search Kafka Summit um, conference talks, they're all posted on the Confluent website, and you can go look back at all the recordings and the summit this year is the 11th to the 12th of May, and because it's virtual, it's free this year, so definitely go register for that. Um, I'm going to be tweeting my session soon, so look out for a tweet, and then you can register through that. But there's loads of companies that talk every year at Kafka Summit about what they're doing with Kafka and like how it's working for them, so that's worth checking out. Thank you. Uh, next question is a bit of a long one, uh, so I'll just uh, start. <laughs> Uh, it, it says, uh, I have migrated from backend to front front end uh, since a couple of years and have discovered the challenging, ch challenges in creating a stable user experience, often in form of mobile apps on top of eventually consistent systems. So I'm interested in your viewpoints on how to achieve the best user experiences on top of these systems. And uh, how do we prevent our coffee lovers from constantly nagging about where our coffee is done yet? Uh, and how do we, uh, how have we make, no, this is a strange sentence, sorry. Uh, how of we make sure they do not observe that their change from a Americano to a Cortado suddenly seems to not have registered with the barista and then make try the change requested a second time and getting frustrated. Sorry for that last paragraph there. I uh, hope, hope it makes, hope it made sense. <laughs> yeah, I think so. So, um, yeah, so actually in event streams, um, we have a, a UI, that's the products that I work on. And I think that some of the things to consider are um, you don't have to make everything um, event driven. So I've been part of a project called Game On, which is a little microservice based uh, text venture game. And for that, we were very specific about which parts of the user interaction should be synchronous versus asynchronous. So, for example, uh, some of the registration um, that we're where we're registering through uh, GitHub or things like that obviously has to be asynchronous. But if people want to change certain pieces, we were making those changes synchronous if we felt that it was just a better user experience to do it that way. Um, for the ones that you think can be asynchronous or should be, I think just making sure it's very clear in the UI what's happening and um, so the user understands it. Because if you think like a lot of companies now, if you place an order online and you submit your order, it will pop up saying, here's your order ID, you will receive an email. So they've given you something so that if something's gone wrong and you never get that email, you have an ID to quote back at them. But it's immediately obvious to the user, oh, okay, you're going to contact me when something's changed. And I think that's what's great about reactive and event-driven is it's about this availability of new information. So if you can find a mechanism where instead of the user having to come back and check, you're going to notify them, and it's a reactive thing of that thing's completed, so now I can do a notification or something, then that creates a better user experience. So I think those are the two things is, if there are places where it really needs to be synchronous, then dig your heels in and make it synchronous. But where there are opportunities to do notifications and make it fully reactive, then do that, but make sure the user understands that's what's going on and that they will get told when this thing has happened. So in the barista example, for example, using what Kate's just described, you could have a system where when the person puts in an order, you immediately, once you've gotten that, once you, you know that that's been acknowledged by Kafka, that order going in, you could then update the board to say, OK, we're processing it. And then you, you might leave that processing message up just to be clear about, you know, we have got your order. It's OK. It's going to be a while. Go sit down and chill. And then, you know, you then 
let the user know it will be updated. You can just, you know, we'll send you a notification, say it might be a text or something that the board updates them or something on their phone. And they might get a text notification when that coffee has been produced and that board has been updated. So, you know, there are ways of creating it where you're you're having clear communication if you do have this asynchronicity so that users know they're waiting and know that they will be notified when that's completed in the end. So it's just about clear communication and about sort of thinking through that design and ensuring that users know exactly where they are on that on that journey. Oh, thank you. Uh, so uh, yeah, the next question in the list is in the in addition to the framework and libraries you presented here, have you tried the core react uh, reactive Java piece like uh, Java nine reactive streams API? Uh, I haven't personally yet, no, um, but I'm excited to. Uh, just like, for example, there's some really interesting projects coming out at the moment, like Project Loom, that I'm looking to sort of get familiar with soon, which will be interesting in terms of there is quite a few debates around, you know, will it get rid of the need for things like reactive programming libraries? So there's some interesting, uh, I guess, progressions that are happening, which means there might be sort of a lack of need of some things, but also new needs for new frameworks. Um, but no, I haven't personally tried it myself yet. Yeah, I'm, I'm similar. I haven't tried it myself, although I do think so. My uh, majority of my work in reactive frameworks has been working with Vertex. And I think there are certain elements of the way Vertex does things that I think will still persist beyond um, bringing in things like the reactive streams API because they have other things and I guess it's similar to like the actor model in um, ACA like there are other abstractions that are really useful as part of those reactive frameworks so it'll be interesting to see if over time more and more of those come into core Java but I think it'll be a while before the reactive frameworks are sort of completely replaced by what's in Java. Thank you. So uh, next is, uh, will Kafka work with WebSocket, uh, Socket's uh, Stomp protocol, like for real-time chat application? So, so Kafka has its own protocol. So you have to communicate with it using the Kafka protocol. Um, what a lot of people often look at, though, is there is Kafka Connect, which is a framework and library which allows you to connect other apps into Kafka. So if you wanted to, you could, if you were using some sort of IoT device or something, you could um, directly like invoke the protocol, but it is quite a complex protocol. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. Um, what I would recommend is having a look at the Kafka ecosystem and if there's a specific um, device or specific uh, framework you're wanting to hook into, have a look at what Kafka connectors are available and also what systems have already implemented the Kafka protocol and will call Kafka because it's a really growing ecosystem. So there is the kind of core Kafka clients produce consume, but the connectors, there are so many that people have written for all sorts of different things. And that is basically a mechanism to get data into Kafka or out of Kafka. And then on top of that, there are quite a few different products and frameworks and whatever that are directly integrating with Kafka. So separately from Connect, they're also providing options to produce and consume from Kafka. So um, not specifically built into Kafka, but have a look around. I'm sure there'll be things that will help you get the data into Kafka if that's what you want. Thank you. Uh, next one, uh, have you used Kafka with Kotlin? And any re reactive framework to recommend? I have not used Kafka with Kotlin. Um, I haven't, but Vertex is a polyglot framework that will work with Kotlin. So uh, if you wanted to try out Kafka and Kotlin, you might want to check out the Vertex uh, framework that we were talking about because it is polyglot, so it does it does do Kotlin. And the Java Vertex integration with Kafka is great. So <laughs> nice. So uh, next is, uh, and uh, so far this is the last question, I think. Um, uh, I have the, uh, this use case that I want to be, uh, publish a Kafka message from my Kafka stream and make sure next request that hits Kafka stream takes into account the message that I just published. Is that possible? 
Okay, so I guess you're, I don't know if you're adding up the requests or noting the previous one or something. What I would say is have a look at the different um, things that come with Kafka streams. So I think you said you were using Kafka stream already, but I don't know if you meant event stream versus Kafka streams library. The Kafka streams library provides options for like aggregation and windowing and things like that. So you can, for example, if you've got sensor data that's putting out temperatures, you can use Kafka streams to get like a, a windowed average where you've got average over the last 10 events or things like that. So there are plenty of different um, mechanisms that are available as parts of Kafka streams. So I would say have a look at that and see if that fulfills your requirements. There's a lot of um, effort that has gone into Kafka streams and adding lots of different uh, use cases that allow you to kind of query a stream of data and not just have to process each individual record. So that's where I'd start. Ah, thanks again. And uh, if we have one uh, more question, I see how that I forgot uh, <laughs> uh, last, one, last time. Uh, okay. Do you have some recommendations for the DevOps part of this? Uh, how do you easily see what happens on your Kafka cluster? And by that, I mean topics and partitions, consumer groups and consumers, partitions, offsets, uh, yes. customer, yeah, customer likes, measure per time, etc. <laughs> it seems like yeah. you need a, yeah. quite so, a lot of tools. Uh, yeah, definitely. Um, I've got a, a couple of recommendations. So um, if you're running, if you're not running your Kafka yourself, uh, then to certainly have a look at the different providers. So for event streams, we have a UI that exposes things like, you know, what producers connected, consumers, consumer groups, metrics, all of the things. Um, but we, under the covers, event stream isn't doing anything um, that isn't supported by default in Kafka. It's just exposing it in a nice, easy to use way. So have a look at the admin um, client for Kafka. You can query lots of stuff like that. You can get JMX metrics out of Kafka. And um, what I would recommend doing is if you're unsure where to start, you're running your own Kafka and you don't know how to keep track of everything and make sure that you can uh, reliably fix problems, then there is a talk that my colleagues, Emma and Tina did at Kafka Summit. It will be in the 2020 like recordings list it's called help my kafka is broken so if you search that i'll see if i can find it and i'll tweet it out later um but that talk they basically go through here are all the different metrics that you should be paying attention to this is how you know whether your kafka is sick this is how you debug the problems like it's a really good talk so i would definitely recommend uh, having a look at that uh, yes thank you and uh Thanks again for this uh, great talk. Uh, it has been uh, it's been a pleasure to uh, li be listening to you tonight, uh, and it's uh, very informative. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, and thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. We enjoyed it. <laughs> Thank you. So uh, yeah, now uh, just uh, go into some no Norwegian on the on the end here. Yep. So uh, yeah, da er vi egentlig på vejs ende med dagens. Jeg har været online møte. Og jeg vil egentlig bare takke de alle i Javabin for å hjelpe å stå på og gjøre det de gjør. Og Børge og Dervis for å være mine kopiloter i kveld med spørsmål og opplysning og testing av løsning. Så vi ses neste gang. Det er et Javabin online meetup. Takk for i kveld.